Inevitably, one night you're going to get a phone call about a patient with respiratory failure. What they usually mean is that they have a patient with an increased PCO2. An increased PCO2 is the hallmark of type 2 respiratory failure. Most people assume that breathing is all about getting oxygen into the blood. And in actuality, breathing is about being able to get rid of carbon dioxide. If somebody is apneic and oxygen is being administered by mask, the oxygen saturations don't fall. The CO2, however, will rise. When somebody develops type 2 respiratory failure, they're unable to excrete the normal amount of carbon dioxide produced by their cells. In these cases, oxygenation is not usually a problem in type 2 respiratory failure. Any associated hypoxemia is usually easily correctable with a little bit of oxygen. If there's a greater amount of hypoxemia, then there must be a shunt in play. And we talked about shunt in our previous video. A fundamental problem in type 2 respiratory failure is a reduction in alveolar ventilation. A reduction in alveolar ventilation is caused by only three things. A loss of drive, or a problem in the brain, a loss of connection, problems with the respiratory muscles and nerves, and a loss of strength, the respiratory muscles fatiguing under an increasing load. When somebody has type 2 respiratory failure from a loss of drive, then there's a problem inside the brain. Simply stated, the patient just doesn't want to breathe. It can be from a myriad of problems that cause coma, including all kinds of drugs, both pharmacological and recreational, the big clue to the loss of drive is the cause of type 2 respiratory failure is the obvious decreased level of consciousness. The patient will not be in any sort of distress despite the increased PCO2. When you listen to the lungs, they'll be clear. When type 2 respiratory failure is due to a loss of connection, there's some problem with the nerves or the neuromuscular junction. A spinal cord injury causing paralysis is a very common cause, as well as ALS. Neuromuscular blockade can occur from medications like rocuronium or antibodies like myosin and gravis. Overall, a loss of connection as a cause for type 2 respiratory failure is relatively uncommon compared to the other two. The clues that a loss of connection is the problem is that the patient is completely awake. The patient will be very distressed from the rising CO2, but yet unable to breathe. And when you listen to their lungs, the lung sounds will be completely normal. Probably the most common cause of type 2 respiratory failure you will encounter is a loss of strength. This is the category that COPD and asthma fall into, and we'll talk more about that in the next video. This is primarily a problem of increased load and in loss of capacity in the respiratory muscles. A normal person breathing spontaneously expends very little effort in respiration, but when the load in the muscles increases, the energy consumption can rise dramatically and the muscles can fail. There are a number of things that can increase respiratory muscle load. An increase in airway resistance from inflammation, mucus plugging, and bronchoconstriction all increase the amount of work the muscles must do in order to ventilate. Lungs that are sick with pneumonia or ARDS also have a decrease in their compliance, which makes it harder for the muscles to move them. When there is severe hyperinflation, the lungs are also overstretched and the increased elastins increases the workload on the muscles. Finally, the changes in dead space ventilation increases the amount of wasted ventilation and increases the amount of work the respiratory muscles have to do in order to maintain a normal PCO2. Rarely, you, you will encounter a patient with an increase in their PCO2 because of increased carbon dioxide production from an infection or an increased carbon di uh, carbohydrate intake and they lack the res muscle reserve in order to excrete that extra carbon dioxide load. An increase in load usually leads to a loss of strength as the respiratory muscle fatigues. The fatigue is compounded by the frequent association with malnutrition and depleted glycogen scores. The lungs are usually hyperinflated, and this causes overstretching of the muscles, and they're not going to be able to operate efficiently to generate an adequate force. The signs of a patient in type 2 respiratory failure from a loss of strength are pretty obvious. These are patients who are awake and distressed by their increased carbon dioxide levels. When you listen to their lungs, 
there is obviously something wrong with them, with wheezing and crackles being obviously heard depending on the cause of the problem. Today we covered the causes of type 2 respiratory failure. Type 2 respiratory failure is an increase in PCO2 without any hypoxemia. It is a problem of reduced alveolar ventilation. It can be caused by either a loss of drive or a loss of connection or a loss of strength. A loss of drive is a central nervous system problem, usually due to something going on in the brain or medication effect whereas a loss of connection is from problems stemming from the nerves or the neuromuscular junction. A loss of strength, on the other hand, is a consequence of increasing respiratory muscle load and an inability to generate an adequate amount of power. Next time, we're going to go into more detail on the common causes of type 2 respiratory failure, acute on chronic respiratory failure.